We're back, you happily miserable accursed. It's David Hurley here, and with me, as they are every week in the comfort of their own Zoom rectangles, super strategists Scott Reed, Jordan Likeness, and Corey Tonight. We have a jam-packed agenda this week, so let's get to it. Today on the pod, we're going to do something different and start with our curse clipping and the discussion it prompts. Chantelle Bear's column in the Star on Christia Freeland's focus on fiscal restraint as we move closer to a fall update, the interplay with her boss, long a proponent of deficit spending to get to this point and what the ramifications might be. Next, Doug Ford will challenge his summons to testify at the Emergencies Act inquiry in court. We'll discuss, maybe like no other political pod could, hey, Corey, Uh, The political calculus that went into that decision. Both of those are pretty robust discussions, but there may be time for some quick takes on other topics before Mr. Pinson calls a halt to these proceedings with our Hey Yous. Jordan, Scott, Corey, I tried to make that sound exciting, but if we were in Britain, in the UK, we could have a truly exciting pod today. I'm sure Scott has 20 jokes about lettuce just sitting there going unused. I'm not. No, the lettuce has been done to death. Uh, you got to. I think we have to move on from the lettuce jokes. I mean, people are repeating themselves on Twitter, and that's you know, you, it's always sad to see people repeating themselves on Twitter. <laughs> sure sign of moral decay. <laughs> Vegetable right. decay in this case. So. Our clipping comes to us courtesy, as I said, of Chantel Hebert in the Toronto Star. Chantel was wondering if the fiscal restraint being championed by Finance Minister Freeland might end the Liberal NDP alliance. Here's a sample. What, for instance, does it mean for the non-aggression pact that currently governs the relationship between the NDP and the minority Liberals? The arrangement between the two parties is based on a common shopping list, not a spending diet. To shore up their fiscal credentials in time for a duel with Conservative leader Pierre Polyev, would Trudeau's Liberals be willing to take the risk of calling a possible NDP bluff about plunging the country into yet another general election by introducing shades of austerity in the spring budget? It would be a calculated risk, but there are Liberals who would rather take a chance on getting defeated on a fiscally restrained budget next spring than risk driving critical right-of-center voters into Polyev's open arms. And to Chantel's column, I would add the variable of Singh's recent attacks on the Bank of Canada's policy on inflation. So, Scott, what do you think about this? Well, to the central question of will it uh, jeopardize the relationship and the pact between the NDP and the Liberals, I think the answer is no, it can't. Um, Because I don't think that the NDP can afford um, can afford to test it. I, I mean, I think that the NDP's power is entirely rooted in the parliamentary leverage they have, and they're far better off to exert um, policy achievements, as they want to characterize them, out of the government, rather than say, all right, now we're going to throw you into, into an election. So just but as how we much can the- they swallow? How much can they I- swallow? Singh looked really uncomfortable on that Emergencies Act question yeah. with Joyce Napier this weekend. I, I think lots. I, I, I think lots. I mean, shitty is shitty, except when the alternative is fatal. And I don't think that they want to uh, bring down this situation, which is the best situation they've had at least in 20 years and arguably more in terms of the position and power that they have. And I think that it's a uh, I think it's a joker's wild if they move from a parliamentary dynamic to an electoral dynamic. That being said, I, so for those reasons, I thought Chantel's column was really interesting, but I don't think that the pact with the NDP is the interesting aspect. I think it's more interesting the relationship between Trudeau and Christian Freeland. Like the Trudeau liberals peddling fiscal austerity just does not play. And, you know, and she talks about, well, there are some liberals that would rather, you know, would rather get defeated on a fiscally austere budget than risk losing right of center voters. What the fuck movie have you been watching? Like, what do you mean you're, wor- you're worried you're going to lose center right liberal? Like, they, they're not there. They're not part of your coalition, I don't think, yeah. really. So, and, and I think. You know, Freeland is clearly signaling over and over and over again, and we see these notes that are included in, in Chantel's column talking about cabinet memorandum, memorandum saying, listen, if you have new spending proposals, they need to be essentially, first and foremost, they, they need to come out of existing budgetary estimates for your own department. Partly. That is, that is yeah. That, partly. That's, partly. That's, we'll see. We'll see if any of this is real. So to me, I think the really interesting thing is how does this government which has never, ever 
talk the talk of fiscal austerity. Freeland's clearly trying to. Is that real? Will it sustain? What will the update look like? What will the estimates in the update be? Will there be a new fiscal anchor that's rigorous? And is Trudeau behind her on all this stuff? Or at the first time or at the first sign of a political or economic turmoil, will we see that the taps are open again? And if so, what kind of tension does that lead to between them? And uh, I think that's there are a really liberals, interesting. There dynamic. are liberals in Ottawa, even in caucus, who aren't sure about the answer to your question about whether Freeland is freelancing. We are now in a stage where everything everybody does is viewed through skepticism about whether Trudeau is going to run again. And so yes. everything is viewed through a leadership prism. And is she staking out some different territory for herself so she's not more of the same when the leadership comes along, but she has a distinct... Uh, so that's a that's a whole separate side of this. Is the government speak? Is the government actually is is she representing the government or is she representing herself? That's the interesting side of it. Can, can I just Jordan, I know I like, uh, yeah. can can I just say one quick thing on that? I don't believe that. I don't believe that this is a. Pol I, I think the last six months. Yeah, well, let's have come shown back it. to it, Scott. Let's come back because I want to go right. to the substance of the matter. And if this is true, and if we're headed to a recession, and if the Bank of Canada is going to keep rising interest rates, and if the government's not going to respond with any fiscal response because it's in restraint mode, Jordan, how long can the NDP live with that? Well, yeah, I mean, I think these are whether it's a good idea and how long the NDP can live with it are two separate questions. So, you know, I think Chantel partially answers her own question in the column. They're, the agreement is based on a shopping list. So for the NDP, they're going to be looking primarily at, are they getting the gains on the shopping list? Are they getting those things through? And that's going to give them a leg to stand on to continue the agreement. So as long as they're seeing progress, I don't really think the agreement is in jeopardy. Now, all that said, whether this is a good idea, I think is a really, really interesting and different question. All signs indicate that we are headed into a recession and that the Bank of Canada is going to have a pretty firm hand in driving us that direction. I think it is... It is a bit of a stunning move for the federal liberals to now say, by the way, Canadians, tough times are coming. You're on your own. We're turning the taps off. Good luck with that. Like this is not this doesn't to me make any sense with their vote coalition. Any right of center voters they had who were really, really concerned about spending have long since left the building. So what they're doing right, th right then is they're jeopardizing the sense that Canadians have that the government can be of any assistance to them in times of trouble and crisis. And the other thing I would say is that I think, you know, when we look at what's happening with federal spending broadly, like federal spending is already dropping dramatically. It dropped over a hundred billion last year. It's contracting like another 3% of GDP this year. So those, those changes are already happening. So the fact that free- well, hang, hang on, whoa, 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 fact check. That's, that's, that's because we were spending World War II money yeah, though. I mean, right. that's a relative yeah, yeah. thing. Yeah, it yeah. is definitely a relative thing, but but that contraction is also happening already, right? So I think that what what we're seeing now, to me, is far more interesting in terms of the question about whether Freeland is positioning herself distinct from Trudeau ahead of a leadership run. I think that that is the interesting question, the dynamic between the two of them. Corey, what's your take on the new language coming from the finance minister and what it portends? Well, I, I'm curious how much of it is is actually a response to concerns of substance uh, around government spending and government debt levels. Like we've just seen uh, a pretty shocking display in the UK as to what happens when a government decides to detach itself from uh, you know uh, from economic reality for a sustained period of time. Even a short period of time can have catastrophic results. So I. The the amount of spending that that's been going on in Ottawa is is not sustainable. You know, uh, we were in a pretty good fiscal si situation as a country. Uh, you know, when uh, when Stephen Harper left office, it's a very different situation now. Uh, we were in a very different situation when, frankly, when the Crutch and Martin uh, governments left office than we were when the Mulroney governments came in. Like we've we've been in positions in the past where we have. Uh, 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 overspent on the credit card to the point where where we had real problems in bond markets and elsewhere. So I I, I think there are real issues that you know it, maybe it's not just politics. I guess is what I'm saying. Maybe there are some substantive concerns in the Ministry of Finance, as you know, which you guys would be very experienced in hearing uh, behind closed doors. I think there are concerns, and um, 
Uh, I think it's very troubled uh, economic situation globally right now. I think uh, there's a lot of things out there that are unpredictable, whether they're with the war with Ukraine, whether they're what's uh, going on with supply chains and the relationship with China. There's all kinds of things that are difficult to predict. Uh, but, uh, you know, spending every, uh, every penny you possibly can, extending your credit to the absolute max right now, uh, I, I would say is, is uh, incautious. And to do it for just simply political reasons uh, is not good governance. So, you know, I'd be worried that there's, that there's more concern uh, behind closed doors at finance than, than what we're hearing. And we're trying to look at everything through a political lens when maybe we should be looking at it through perhaps a slightly different lens around the policy itself. Well, on the politics, because I'm not an economist, on the politics, I'm confused. Because as Jordan points out, well, let me say that my polling, there's about 30% of Canadians that would rank the deficit as one of their top two public policy concerns, right? None of those people are voting for the Liberal Party currently. Um, and it would probably take a lot of change for them to consider voting for the Liberal Party. So it's not, it's not an obvious move you make to improve your standing vis-a-vis uh, -vis the other parties. And in terms of a leadership position play for Freeland. The Liberal Party in convention is more left than its voters are in election. So running for the leadership of the Liberal Party as a fiscal hawk, um, and I say this with some experience, is is not the ideal not the ideal positioning to be to be in for the liberal delegation. So if she if her point of differentiation with Trudeau is that she's more conservative fiscally that probably, in my view, weakens her as a potential replacement for him, not strengthens. But, does, doesn't, so that I, lend, but doesn't that lend things towards what I'm saying? Because the yeah. politics of this make absolutely no sense. So well, that's where, and, that's where and, I, and I don't, And I don't think Christia mm -hmm. Freeland, for whatever her shortcomings are, I don't think she's a stupid person. No. Uh, so, like, you know, why is she saying that? Why is she doing it? Because the politics, you know, as you point out, are, are, are not... Uh, they don't make sense from a leadership differentiation point of view. They don't make sense from an overall uh, Trudeau Liberal Party electoral coalition point of view. So why is it happening? And I think, you know, it would appear that it's not just her freelancing. It would appear that this is, you know, coming uh, from the center as well as, as the finance ministry. So why is that? But it's I'm not sure not about that last politics. point you make. I'm not sure about that last point you make, but I think in broad strokes, well, I no do one's out backspinning. No one's out backspinning no, saying I'm she's freelancing. And and normally, if that would be the case, or it was that, you would be getting that. We'd be all we'd all be picking it up. Yeah, but it's all just harmless talk right now. So we'll sort of see. I mean, decisions, and there, and I don't even think the fiscal update. I mean, they could easily rationalize allowing her to take whatever stance she ha wants in the fiscal update and say, well, that's we're trying to send a signal, see how it plays. But come budget time, and deals with the NDP and uh, responses to the pressures of a recession, then that's where. Uh, the rubber will hit the road. I just want to say, in broad terms, I think you guys, this discussion is taking us, the three of you, I think, have talked us into a conclusion, which is that this isn't leadership positioning. That That's for sure. It's not, right? It doesn't make any sense on almost any level. I think that she came, I, I think she knows two things, arguably. Um, I think that over the course of the past four or five months, she knows that Trudeau either is or maybe she knows the rest of us don't that Trudeau is definitely running in the next election and therefore that's no longer like part of her uh, calculus or secondly uh, she may know that over the course of the summer um, that she's not a viable contender to be the next uh, leader of the Liberal Party because um, certainly that's a lot of stuff that I started hearing from caucus members and fellow cabinet ministers who previously told me that she was unassailable as the front runner had completely turned and were like, oh my goodness, like we don't see the political, the range of political skill necessary to actually run a campaign, lead a party to success, match the uh, populist fire of, of somebody like Pierre Polyev. And so I think she's decided I'm going to be the finance minister. I'm sick and tired of listening to David Hurley bitch and moan on his podcast. I'm going to actually, you know, to crack the whip. I'm going to come down and say, listen, it's time for some fiscal austerity. And the real question is going to be, okay, um, is that what Trudeau really thinks? Will he tolerate it out of convenience or conviction for now, but not necessarily for because long? Because the prime minister is so critical in this. I mean, th this business about you've got to reallocate. Like, I'll just say this as one of Paul Martin's guys. Paul Martin would be the first person to say that 
as finance minister, he couldn't have done anything if the prime minister didn't back him. Colin Nett tried to do a power play. If hadn't looked the other cabinet ministers in the eyes and said, fuck your requests, what he said is what happens, right? Then it doesn't go down that way. And finance ministers have not had that backing from their premiers or prime ministers in the past, and that's how it goes. Little so, blast in the past, right, David? David Colinette, after the 90, well, even I think prior, it was prior to that, it was a lead up to the 95 budget where, um, you know, they sort of instituted new processes. You had to do a memorandum to cabinet and it had to have a source of funds prior and all that sort of stuff. Couldn't just walk in with an unfunded uh, MC. Uh, David, David Colinette was probably the first. Uh, Chrétien Loyalist tried to do an end run on the process. And so Chrétien made the point of saying in full cabinet, fucking no. Right. If you like, don't come crying to me. Don't try to make me the court of appeal. I'm not going to be. Bring your MCs to the table as per the process. I want to see them dealt with in committee. I don't want this bullshit brought to me at 24. And I don't want this bullshit brought to full cabinet where they're unfunded. And if Paula didn't have that backing, then none of the discipline of the process would have helped. So the question is, when we get on the eve of the next budget and you've got people saying, God, help is needed in everything. Oh, my goodness. So we're going to if we're going to we're going to fulfill our climate policies, we're going to have to just spread money around like uh, like 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 water. Um, I just wonder if if. Trudeau holds. It'll be interesting to see. And if he doesn't, what does that mean? How does Christian Freeland handle herself? Should a white paper still be called a white paper in an increasingly paperless society? This thought occurred to me at 3 a.m. recently, and I apologize for this little glimpse into my strange, tortured life. Regardless, we're at the end of our storytelling journey here, Hurley Burleyites, about TELUS's Spectrum White Paper, reforming Canadian spectrum policy for 5G and beyond. You can find it online at telus.com slash spectrum policy. If you haven't yet clicked through and you're interested in the good that connectivity can produce in our lives, I humbly suggest you check it out. TELUS has been compiling research from all over the world of how spectrum policy can be used to advance social, economic, and environmental objectives. The timing of all this couldn't be better because, as I speak these words, the millimeter wave consultation is underway to determine how the next auction of spectrum in this country should be framed. Not only that, but Innovation Science and Economic Development Canada, I said, is also currently exploring how spectrum policy can intersect with our desired societal outcomes in their spectrum outlook, a five-year plan for managing this vital resource. So, back to the white paper. In it, TELUS thoughtfully puts forward a number of spectrum policy solutions, all supported by international best practices. It too presents a long-term view. The intention of all of it is simply this, getting the most spectrum in use and doing good for Canadians as quickly as possible, because connecting people to what matters most is what matters most to TELUS. Again, check it out for yourself at telus.com slash spectrum policy. So I, I do think that there's some wishful thinking happening in terms of what Freeland's trying to do around conditioning the public to accept less help uh, and to accept lower spending. I don't envy the position of going out and telling Canadians who are arguably staring down the worst impacts are yet to come of COVID economically for Canada. And if the line is now that the federal government is not going to be here to assist you in any meaningful way, that is a huge problem electorally for the Liberals because the central thesis of this government has been that we will be here, that more government is of assistance to you, and we've got your back when times get tough. And if that goes away, I don't, I don't really like that calculus for the government. Well, being there for you is going to change. We're going to, it's going to mean something a little different now. Moral support. <laughs> Being there support. for you. Well, the Ontario government's still finding ways to get money out the door, right? With this latest thing is the two hundred dollar uh, math subsidy or whatever the hell it is. You can call it whatever it is. They're shoveling money out the door and getting money into people's pockets. Jordan, I mean, I think there's going to be two real pressure points. There's going to be the there's there's going to be uh, the middle class. I don't have enough money to maintain my lifestyle pressure point, and then there's going to be the EI pressure point. Because we dodged a bullet on EI in COVID because we just designed the SERP. But EI is a broken, broken program that ensures well right. less than half of the people that are working in the country. And so if you start to get mass unemployment from a from a, a recession, 
we don't have a safety net for those people. Well, and they actually, and now the EI supports the extra ones. They've all been eliminated. So we're now down to like roughly a third of Canadians qualifying. The system doesn't even touch people who are self-employed. It is, it's absolutely broken. And so I don't know how you plausibly say that you're going to go into a recession without adjusting that to actually provide some support. I, I think it's very dangerous politically. Corey, what's your take? Well, yeah, like I, I think we are going to see uh, a recession. I think we're in one now. We'll, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll see how it plays out. I think, uh, as we've talked about before, we're going to see job losses as, as, as we do in recessions. Uh, but we're going to see, running parallel to that, a lot of job vacancies in the economy too. And, and we're going to have a lot of disconnects uh, in terms of the experience that di- various Canadians are having. And they're going to be further... Uh, uh, further exacerbated by the problems with the EI system, the type of employment they have, the region of the country they're living in, there are a lot of there are a lot of different factors at play. And you know, where is the ultimate bottom of the safety net? It ends up being you know the welfare system at the provincial level. Provinces are broke. Uh, provinces are are you know underwater on healthcare. They're underwater on uh, on a number of things from a financial point of view. Um, uh, but, you know, what's not going to fix it is, uh, you know, shoveling out small amounts of money and checks to target voter groups, which is what, you know, what the GST rebate and what the, uh, the, uh, the dental care plan that they've rolled out so far are. These are not adequate tools to deal with what's going to be coming. So, you know, I think, I think there are big, big issues there. Uh, but, you know, I, I think they're big issues in terms of how Ottawa is spending money uh, generally. When you look at the number of uh, jobs that have been added to the public service uh, over the last year and a half and the results coming out the other end, you know, there, there's, there's a pretty good pay, uh, case to be made that, that the public service is not being managed very well right now. So we're not Can we getting, all agree, I, by the way, that even though they didn't quite get the result they wanted, the Liberals were fucking, uh, or should be damned glad they got that election out of the way when they did. Yeah. yeah, I agree yeah. with that. <laughs> Absolutely. Timing's everything. Mm. Uh, I agree with that, but they could end up in another one at any moment. <laughs> right? By the way, there's good, There's another risk that's obvious and inherent in all of this, and that's incoherency, right? A government that has never talked about fiscal responsibility is suddenly going to try to make it their principal message for a few months. Just as people are starting to go from a cost of living crisis to a recession, they're feeling pain. It's going to not make sense. You're going to get this weird Ottawa versus the world phenomenon when you're going to start hearing cabinet ministers who will feel the bite of this because cabinet ministers will be frustrated in their ability to send any request they want up the hill and have it be a stamped yes. So you're going to hear them moaning and whining to media going, Jesus Christ, I know people doubt this, but God, I Scott, can't get what Scott I Bryson want. Told me, Scott Bryson told me once that when you send something up the hill, the answer isn't just yes. The answer is, does that come with leather seats? Yeah. <laughs> so now you're going to have ministers in, 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 incoherently saying, I can't get what I want. I mean, God almighty, the system's really tight and we aren't getting credit for like how tough fisted we are. We are so tight fisted and it's going to make no sense to anybody because it doesn't connect to what people's experience are. Uh, and then uh, and then in the spring, they'll probably swallow themselves and do a big health care deal and have a budget that you know, is, 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 uh, fiscally relieving. And so well, where, but, where does that leave them? But, but that's the other part of Chantel's column that we haven't talked about, which is, uh, you know, she raises the point that there is likely, uh, irresistible pressure from all of the provinces, uh, you know, represented by premiers from every different party that's out there, except the greens, because no one would ever be crazy enough to put them in charge of anything. But every other party has got premiers in the mix who are, uh, uh, speaking with one voice uh, and now running ads on radio, I hear, uh, talking about the need for increased health care funding. And I, and I think I will be in irresistible pressure. But where's that money going to come from? Like, I, at some point, the government does have to look at its fiscal capacity and make tough decisions. And this is a, a, a government that is, as you say, David, you know, wants leather seats with everything. They haven't made a single tough fiscal decision in the life of this government. Once, not once that I can see, like their answer to everything is bring another dump truck full of money and put it into the hole. Like that's, that's been their approach. So, you know, it, it, I agree with Scott too. There's a communications incoherence in the message they're going to try to sell, but it could also be true. What I suggested earlier that, you know, maybe there's only a finite number of dump trucks full of money here and maybe some tough decisions have to be made at some point. 
And maybe that's uh, what they're starting to position because that is, in fact, the reality of the situation. Remember shopping? How easy it used to be? Remember the days before we started begging dealers to let us pay full price for a new car? Remember fully stocked inventory? Remember being happily ignorant of the term supply chain? The days before China started choking off our choices by shutting down entire mega factories because of a single COVID diagnosis, and Russia began savagely disrupting grain and fuel supplies, and Brexit, and all those other things economists refer to as externalities, and the rest of us refer to as well, well, you know. Anyway, let's talk internalities, for lack of another term. Pretty clearly, the NAFTA trading bloc is going to have to make some new arrangements. Onshoring, to use another economist term. The fact is, our domestic supply chains work very well indeed, and we'd all be better off if we relied on them more. Our sponsor, CN, is the veins and arteries of Canada's supply chains, and a good chunk of America's too. And CN keeps cargo moving on time. The railway is delighted to boast that last week it moved a record amount of grain out of Western Canada, 806,000 tons in seven days. Grain season is in full swing right now, and there had been some gloomy predictions about whether farmers would be able to get their crop to market on time this year. Well, they have. Witness last week, witness last month, the second best September ever for grain movement out of Western Canada. CN knows the trick is to synchro mesh all the moving parts of the machine to develop accurate forecasting, ensure supply chain partners collaborate, and to move fast when kinks develop. As when a bridge fire shut down a CN branch line in northern Alberta October 5th, a CN crew worked around the clock, moving the equivalent of 20 Olympic-sized swimming pools of earth and rock, laying new tracks and reopening the line to grain shipments within a week. The world is less reliable. But CN's trains keep leaving and arriving on time. Cargo has to move, period. Because we've we've spent no time in this conversation, though, talking about what are the fucking politics for the NDP? Like, how long, to Corey's point, how long can they fucking hang on to dental, whatever that dental program is relative to what you expected it to be? How long can you hang on to dental when EI isn't getting fixed and there isn't money into healthcare? I mean, like... Well, I've I mean, spoken to all 17 people who are receiving it, and they like it a lot. <laughs> it's just there's only 17 of them. Well, now, Corey, just because you don't know anyone who's making less than $90,000 a year doesn't mean that people don't like it. Listen, $90,000. Uh, he doesn't know anybody who doesn't spend $90,000 a year on art. <laughs> That were, that's where the Elvis came from, right? Yeah. I mean, listen, I think I think it's important. I want to note a couple of things. And just very briefly on the dental, having had some hand in, in creating the initial proposal, uh, it was always designed, you know, the NDP did initially envision it as an insurance scheme like this. So I don't like they're not offended by like the structure of it in its current form. Um, but what is done this year is only the to do for this year, right? Like the agreement with the Liberals spells out a build of that program. Is that sufficient for the problems that we're facing? No. But I think the politics for the NDP are this. They are going to continue to work on the items in the agreement, and they're going to need to see meaningful progress on that in order to justify support. If Freeland comes out with a fall fiscal update that in any way smells of austerity, there's going to be a problem for them. Uh, There cannot be a situation where it appears that they're supporting a government that is somehow telling Canadian workers that you're on your own. Uh, well, you know, meanwhile, corporate profits are soaring and that burden is not being shared between workers and the corporate sector. So there's going to have to be some balance on that coming from the government, I think, in order to see continued NTP support, especially as we go into the spring and into the budget. So that's what I would be watching for. You know, we see now there's there's some sustained focus from the NDP on uh, cost of living stuff around groceries. We see the Competition Bureau investigating. So, you know, they're mining that shaft, I think, very successfully for them right now. But if I could um, just if I could just challenge yeah. a little bit, because sure. b- because I'm watching that and I'm watching Jagmeet Singh's rhetoric start to match Pierre Polyev's rhetoric. Not in substance, not in what they're saying, but what they're talking about and the tone yeah. at which they're talking about it, right? So it feels to me that if that continues, if Singh starts to give full-throated critique 
to the government's approach to the economy, then the cognitive dissonance of supporting the government becomes unsustainable. Well, I think the difference there, David, is that unlike Pierre Polyev, Singh is in a position to change some things because he's part of the agreement, right? So I think he is ideally uh, setting himself up for some things that he can have some success in based on his conversations with the liberals. Uh, you know, Jagmeet and the team around him are experienced. They're not dumb. So they're not going to set up a question that they don't know the answer to uh, going into the spring. So I think that that's part of the work that they're now doing through the fall. And we'll see what happens through the update. But I think that the real danger zone for them comes if what Freeland is proposing now around some fiscal restraint starts to move into the sphere of cuts and starts to threaten the notion that there would be support. Because when we talk about going into a recession, we talk about unemployment, like, like that's not just numbers on a line, right? Like we know that if people are thrown out of work now, it is not so easy necessarily to get people back in. As Corey's talked about, we do have a mismatch in some of these things long-term job scarring, like these are all things that people are going to be feeling in their communities and in their lives. And so the NDP has to be really attentive to that. But I think that they're aware of all of those pieces. And I think they're trying to work the leverage that they have, which is something that Polyev doesn't. Why not bring I the really, government down then? Like, well, uh, that's, I mean, that's what, that's, I think that that's what I would at, do at the end of the road, point, if, if the, you know, they, they may get there, but I think that they're going to try to squeeze the juice out of the deal as much as they possibly can before that's the outcome, because you only can the, push that button once. Right. The, 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 well, they surrender all their leverage the moment that they turn this from a parliamentary to an electoral strategy. And they have to have built up a base of wins in order to pursue even their own preferred strategy of saying, we got you these things, which I don't believe pays off, but they do. And they haven't gotten there yet. I really think I'm the height of cynicism on this. Like, I think the liberals go to a cupboard that's labeled fig leaf. They pull out a small one and they pull out a big one. They offer the small one until the last second of negotiations. Then they hand over the big one and then it all goes back to like just running as is. Like, I just, it'll be boosting on dental care, dooming this or that. But I just, it'll be a fig leaf strategy to patch through uh, the parliamentary uh, circumstance. Hey. That, think, is, that is Scott's news of the day, by the way, that Trudeau requires a large fig leaf. <laughs> ah! <laughs> well, I, I, I think it might not just be a program. I think that, uh, I think that uh, Jagmeet's uh, onto something with some of the tone and, and things that he's talking about. Uh, you know, whether it's critiques of the Bank of Canada, which I'll, 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 I'll unacceptable. Uh, talk, talk unacceptable. Ab ab <laughs> I really want to hear Corey's thoughts about uh, means critiques of the Bank of Canada. Well, I like my popcorn I, here. Yeah, well, like, I, I, I think that uh, uh, I think that the public generally agrees that uh, the, this notion that uh, that people who work at the Bank of Canada are somehow part of some secret priesthood of uh, uh, infallible individuals that only have one position and it's virtuous and correct all the time. Like, uh, can you think of any part of the economy or government or anything else where that is the case? Of course, there are different, different approaches and things that can be taken and that you can find Nobel laureate economists who disagree profoundly on, on questions like this. So you can be smart and have different opinions on these things. The question is, uh, is what the Bank of Canada is doing uh, consistent with what the economy needs and what what the finance uh, minister and the, and the prime minister and others thinks is, are correct. Like there is room for feedback in this. I think they could put some pressure on the bank. I think that could be a fig leaf. I think they could do things like bringing in, uh, you know, undue profit taxes on uh, unpopular parts of uh, the corporate sector that, uh, you know, provide political wins for them. I think I think they could do a number of different things that, uh, are beyond just, you know, program spending. And I, I would be looking to see what what things like that they go for, because I, I think, you know, uh, from a policy point of view, people like me or or the Conservative Party are unlikely to ever go into those waters because we disagree profoundly with with uh, with that approach. But uh, but it's not unpopular with everybody. That's for sure. And I you think know, what Corey's saying in terms of things like the excess profit tax, that's just the kind of burden sharing that it's so important to see. That it's not just about telling Canadians to expect less from their government. There's not going to be assistance. There's already that th there's also going to be uh, you know, some some pain felt by uh frankly corporate Canada that a lot of Canadians feel is profiteering. With apologies to Maurice and the boys. Do you remember the second last month, November? My riders this year, just pretenders, the great cup of dream away.
November for me is the quintessential Canadian month. Grey Cup is one reason. Another is that it's Diabetes Awareness Month. We've taken a well-deserved measure of national pride in the discovery of insulin, but that was, get ready for it, over a century ago. So on behalf of our sponsor, Diabetes Canada, these are the sobering facts. Diabetes and prediabetes takes a lifelong mental and physical toll on more than 11.7 million people in this country. One out of every three people in Canada. It costs our healthcare system almost $50 million each day to treat diabetes and its complications. Staggering, really. So it's fantastic that federal government has just tabled the framework for diabetes. Diabetes Canada is on a mission to end diabetes. The tabling of the framework is an important step, but now it's time to implement the framework in five key ways. Provide adequate resources so that our communities have access to the supports, medications, and devices for everyone. Measure, measure, measure our progress to create ultimate accountability for every action that's taken. Get better data. That means scaling up and creating new data connection points, as well as increasing the sharing of that data so that we improve how people live. Fund education programs to improve our understanding with tools that are inclusive, culturally appropriate, patient-focused, and work to reduce stigma. Advance creative and impactful research to emphasize innovation in the treatment and management of diabetes and its impact on marginalized communities. It all adds up to millions of lives and billions of taxpayer dollars saved. Diabetes Canada reminds you that November is an excellent time to consider these priorities and budget 2023 next spring, the critical time to implement them. You know, to go back to, to go back to Paul in 95, in the 1995 budget, there was a surcharge, a surtax on banks in the mm-hmm. 1995 budget, that. and the, the officials in the Department of Finance were apoplectic about it. Oh, yeah. They said, this will make us look like a banana republic. There's no justification for this. It's absolute bullshit. And Paul said, we're asking everybody in Canada to make a sacrifice. How can we not ask these people to make a sacrifice? That's just the, I mean, so it's it, it falls into that category, I think. Just a word on the bank, Corey, because you're right. They're not a priesthood. They can obviously be wrong. But I think what we've learned over centuries is that they're almost never wrong the way politicians think that they're wrong. And that the one thing that would be worse um, than having uh, an untouchable group of priests managing the money supply would be to have politicians managing the money supply. Yeah. I think, I think you can have a, a mix between the two. Like politicians get to pick the judges. They get to pick the governor or the bank of Canada. And, you know, there are processes by which you change that. Uh, that person mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. you want to have independent decision making, but on the broad strokes of, of what direction you're wanting uh, to go, like I, for sure, uh, I think there should be some alignment and uh, you know, I think there are criticisms of the bank of Canada that have merit. I, you know, I think we heard a lot of stuff about how uh, inflation was transitory and that this was just supply chain disruptions uh, associated with COVID, et cetera. Uh, and they were completely fucking wrong. So, you know, it's uh, so I think, you know, instead of taking, you know, smaller action earlier in the process, you know, like a little bit of chemotherapy in time, now we're taking a lot of chemotherapy and radiation, and now we're going in for surgery. And, you know, we, we let it drift too far. I think there were, you know, there's criticism there that, that, you know, you can read. And I think, you know, I'm not an economist either, but I think there's some merit uh, in some of those arguments. So I, I, I think, there's also a political constituency of reasonable people out there who will say, maybe we've got some problems at the Bank of Canada, too. And as you know, I, and are going to hear some of the things that uh, Pierre Polyev is saying and say, I agree. You know, we had too much fiscal easing or well, challenges know, come with that, though. Challenges come with that, because if you're going to sure, say, but, but if, if you're you, going to say, you, if you deny there's any problem, like I think there's challenges that go with that, too. No. Yeah, and I'm, I think I'm just saying once you say I'm replacing the governor of the Bank of Canada, and I'm not doing so because I'm a wild eyed politician who wants to just make all those decisions partisanized, but rather I have a fundamental difference of view in terms of broad set direction, you're going to have to define what that broad set of direction is. And the challenge is that the critiques that he has made of the gov- of the Bank of Canada are fundamentally rooted in non reality. And they're not going, you're not going to be able to find a reasonable set of criteria that correspond to the criteria 
critiques that you've made. You're not going to find uh, this governor uh, would be governor agrees with me that they won't print money anymore. Well, actually, they never fucking printed money. They purchased bonds and it's a whole other play. And so I just think, you know, if he's going to that, that, there's at. Uh, I agree with you, you right now merit, on the do you rhetoric think point that we waited too long to deal with inflation and that we didn't take it seriously. Of course. I, well, yeah, but that's Monday morning quarterbacking. And I would say that we were wrong in, along with the entire developed world. And that doesn't make it better. Not, but it also. But, that, but that's not the case, Scott, because Canada is is leading the G7 in terms of how aggressive we are on the the hikes and the rate. So well, that's, the, that's really, the opposite of Corey's argument, though. Yeah. <laughs> and you know what? Really? And you know what? Well, since, we're ver- we, since we're we since we're verging more, into be, since we're verging we, into becoming economists ourselves, <laughs> might be time to move on. We just yes, play the monkey. Let's do that before we do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, I uh, I've watched a lot of shows about hospitals and medicine, but don't let me ever perform surgery. I'm just warning you. But there you should go. fall in love with a nurse because that's what those shows are really about. <laughs> well, Corey, we're going to put you on, on the t- we're going to put you on the table right now. So, All right, uh, because. We find out this week that Premier Ford does not want to appear at the commission investigating the use of the Emergencies Act. And um, I don't know what the substantive reasons are, but the politics of it seem difficult to me because it looks like he's got something to hide. On the other hand, we know that the government's very anxious, doesn't want to talk about COVID anymore. So, Corey, can you take us through the political considerations around not appearing and challenging a summons to appear. Well, I think uh, I think they're they're not unique to this situation. I think you guys have gone through similar things uh, before, and there are different opinions about how to handle it. No, but nobody asked but, me for advice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no one ever um, the uh, look, uh, you know, what is what is inquiry ultimately about? You know, it is about the federal government's decision to invoke the Emergencies Act. And there's a, you know, a statutory re- responsibility or requirement to examine that and see whether there is a justification for doing it or not. Right. That's that's what it's about. So this is about a federal government decision. You know, what's going on at the actual commission is become something much broader. And what I think you're seeing going on with it is, is a bit of a finger pointing blame game about, you know, all kinds of other issues. Uh, but the, the but and you know the government uh, you know to the uh, disappointment I think of the commissioner has expanded the mandate to include all kinds of other things other than that one question. Uh, but it is about that one question. You know, was it justified to do it or not? Uh, it's not the premier of Ontario's responsibility to answer that question. It is not any other premier's responsibility to answer that question. Uh, uh, these are protests that involved people from every other province and included protest sites in a number of other provinces. But I think there is a desire by, uh, by some of the interveners in, in this process to, you know, litigate, uh, pandemic measures generally, everything from vaccine mandates to masks mandates, et cetera. And I think they want to kind of divert what that that is about onto those topics. And I just don't see why uh, the Premier of Ontario uh, uh, or any other Premier put in that position would want to play along. Like it's it's OK. It's, so that's the substantive answer. And thank you right. for that. But politically now, how do you manage through this and not make him look shifty? Well, I, look, I, I think I think you got to put out some communications as to what your rationale is and, and be direct with folks. But I don't think anybody thinks that uh, Doug Ford is somebody who hides from things. The guy did a press conference for like an hour, uh, hour a day, like for two thirds of the, pra- uh, the pandemic. He's one of the most accessible politicians in the country. So I, I don't, I don't think there's anything about hiding, but in terms of, you know, decision, do you want to go and, and go through that process and play along with that fake narrative? Or do you want to just say, no, I'm not going. Well, this is, uh, and you know, this is curse of politics. So I'm going to swear a little bit here. Um, do you want to eat your own shit sandwich, or do you want to have a 12 course tasting menu of other people's shit? Because that's <laughs> that's that's what the options are here. And and neither of them is going to taste good. But I know what I prefer: less shit, not more. My shit, not somebody else's. I don't want to eat a bunch of someone else's shit. And uh, and that's what I think it comes down to. So. You know, it's not like either one of these paths is an easy path, but one is a lot more unpleasant than the other. Yeah. 
So, Jordan, there's no opposition in Ontario, so he probably gets away with this, right? Yeah, I mean, I think I think he would get away with it even if there was an opposition in Ontario. I think that uh, although, you know, I, there are many who may wish it were different, I don't think that he's going to pay a price for this. I think voters in Ontario have been abundantly clear that they view this as all being in the past and of no great consequence outside of what's happening in Ottawa. So, you know, is it going to be an awkward couple of weeks with the, with the Queen's Park Press Gallery? Sure, maybe. Um, and, and then the world moves on. So I don't think he pays a price for this. I think, um, un- unfortunately, I think Corey's right on this one. Uh, and, and that's probably the smart move for him. I do think, though, that um, it's too bad because I think that Certainly his testimony would be, uh, number one, a lot of fun and very interesting and could also provide some very, very intriguing fuel that might tempt Pierre Polyev into the fray a little bit um, uh, on this more broadly, which I think, as we've discussed previously, is not necessarily a great space for him. So I am I am sad on that level that he's not coming. And I'm sad also proving that, that they know, made the right decision. Obviously, Right. Of course, they absolutely yeah. did. Like, this yeah. is bait. Don't go for it. But, you know, and, and I do think that at a certain point, you know, when there is no punishment for this from voters like, you know, what? How, how are people going to do better? Right. <laughs> to, to, to quote Admiral Akbar, it's a trap. <laughs> Scott, I, I, I'm I'm probably too afraid of media, but I would have been afraid not to go a little bit. Oh, yeah. Um, well, I don't think any of it makes sense. I mean, I, I, this is going to be awkward, but I'm sorry, I don't find any of it compelling, uh, Corey. And I'll just I'll just lay my case out. Um, uh, Doug Ford hasn't been shy in saying that he supported the Emergencies Act. He said it just two weeks ago, but he also, I mean, after kind of being uh, sort of heads down during the play, he was he was emphatic once you saw things in Windsor. Um, I don't think there's some weird conspiracy around his voter coalition and he's anxious about that because he didn't show any hesitation uh, to deal with those questions directly during COVID in terms of what he said in front of the microphones day after day after day in terms of telling uh, Room of Arbor, get the fuck out of uh, caucus. Like I just, so th- none of that adds up to me. And, you know, the reality is that- Doug They hate Ford him as is- as I can tell on social media, those right. people hate him, right? So against all that, there's the reality that Doug Ford is not the premier of- City Alpha 5. He's the premier of Ontario. Ottawa is in Ontario. The OPP uh, is the police force that governs most uh, much of Ontario. Let me finish. Let me finish. Let me finish. Let me finish. Let me, let me, let me finish. Please, please. I want to lay out the case because I didn't interrupt you because, and I don't find what you said compelling. And if, and, and if your p- purpose is that the mandate of the thing is to get to determination as to whether or not it was justified to invoke the act, well, I, I think very plausibly you can't make that determination if you're the commission unless you have an understanding as to why it escalated to the point where, you know, the OPP hadn't done more earlier. And I think there are reasonable questions to ask of the premier and the former solicitor general around that. So I don't. I don't really find all these. I don't think that there's a lot of political jeopardy. I don't think it's a trap. I don't think there's a lot of jeopardy in going to this thing and just testifying, being straight up, unless, and taking on the risk of all the criticism you're going to get, the suspicion that's going to be provoked, and one thing we haven't mentioned and calculated, which is that the appeal may 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 fail, and they may get a determination of sorry, you've got to actually go to the summons, in which case you take all of the grief for fighting it, plus you end up in that place anyway. So why would you open yourself up to all of that criticism unless there is something that you're uncomfortable about, unless there's some decision that appears to con- in truth that contradicts what was done um, uh, behind closed doors. And I don't have any particular, I don't have any theory on that because I don't know. It doesn't make sense to me. I don't, I've seen no evidence for any of that. But the behavior of the Premier and the Solicitor General, former Solicitor General, in responding to the summons makes me sincerely suspicious that this calculation is all cocked up unless there's something that you don't want to talk about under oath. Well, I, I, I'm just going to correct a couple of key facts. The OPP are not the police force in Ottawa. They do not have jurisdiction in Ottawa. It's they Ottawa had responsibilities in this situation, though. They were it's being asked Ottawa to coordinate, escalate. Service. Before you get to the Ottawa RCMP and the service. feds, you need the OPP to say. Service. And the RCMP and, you know, and a decision to invoke the Federal Emergencies Act, for which the province of Ontario has no responsibility. 
This is a federal decision, an inquiry into a federal decision. It is not the purview of the Premier of Ontario or any other Premier. Now, when asked what his opinion is on, on the use of the act, the Premier's been clear. He supported it. And he supported it on the basis of giving the police whatever tools they need to go and get the job done. But it's not, the, it's not a politician's job to, uh, to take ownership of another politician's decisions and explain them for people. So, you know, what, what's the downside? You're talking about uh, something that, that is, not your, is not your purview. Uh, and you're, you're getting yourself in a crossfire between a bunch of political adversaries who would love to drag you in, either to deflect from their own ineptitude and, and irresponsibility, uh, you know, fill in uh, 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 former Mayor Jim Watson in that case, uh, uh, or... Uh, you know, you're in a crossfire where there's no win. So if you say, yeah, I supported uh, the decision to do that, then you've got, you know, the federal caucus uh, for the conservatives and Pierre Polyev shooting at you. And if you, uh, if you say something in, uh, other than that, then you're contradicting your own record in terms of having supported it. So like you're just getting into a bun fight between a bunch of people that's not your issue. Uh, I, I would do you think he'll pay a price for it, Scott? Do you think he'll pay a price for it? It, it, it depends. It dep if, if he doesn't have to testify, then he probably won't. But if, in fact, he's forced to testify, then he gets it both ways coming and going. And if there is something that's discomforting and, that's, and it proves out in retrospect that that's really what was happening here, then, yeah, it'll be severe. But I, I would just say to, to Corey's argument, I would agree with you if it was a summons for a parliamentary uh, committee where they were looking into it. Because you go, look, this is going to just be a fuck show. This is just a partisan gong play. But this is a commission of inquiry. Right. You, you talk about it. Well, it's, you know, Admiral Ackler. It is a partisan a trap. gong to an it, it isn't. It isn't. It's, it's a you commission of inquiry that's being run on actual rules with rigor and it's uh it, it there's it hasn't betrayed any particular bias it hasn't been irresponsible and weird and all that stuff so far and so uh you would think that the premier would be happy to explain what he did what he didn't do and and how come and so the reason that he doesn't want to and that he's willing to take on the political punch of uh, going to the courts to avoid a summons suggests to me that there's something that he doesn't want to be asked about under oath. I just can't figure out any other political explanation for it. Okay. There's one more thing I want to jam into uh, this pod today. And Jordan, get ready. Um, and, and that is um, out in BC, we had a very peculiar situation with the NDP leadership. Um, one of the two candidates for the office was disqualified by the party some people say it was because that candidate was attempting a hostile takeover of the New Democratic Party with no intention of being a New Democrat. Uh, other people say it was because she was going to beat the favored candidate of the establishment. Jordan, can you sort it out for us what went down out there? Yeah, so I think it's neither of those things. And, and I think it's, it's uh, the whole situation is really unfortunate. It's definitely not how E.B. wanted to, to start uh, his, his leadership. But what it comes down to questions around integrity of the vote, right? So you had an issue where you had a third party organization soliciting memberships and coordinating with uh, one candidate's campaign. Uh, that is a violation of the rules. So the party really, I think they had no choice but to disqualify based on that. Um, if you don't follow the rules and uh, the folks who were involved in that, you know, should have known better um, because they gave the party a really clear grounds for disqualification. Uh, and that's what they did. And I think it's, uh, it is unfortunate because there were a lot of people who were excited um, and, and maybe drawn to joining the party because of enthusiasm around climate issues. I don't think all those people are going to stay. I'm not sure all those people were new Democrats, so that's okay. Um, but, uh, you know, it's a rocky start for EB, but I, I don't think ultimately it's going to be a fatal blow for them. No, I don't think, I don't know if it's, I don't, I wasn't suggesting it was fatal, but if I could just probe one more question, which is, yeah. it it would seem to me to be the case that the professional management of the NDP in BC could not have tolerated her victory. I think that the, the professional management of the NDP couldn't tolerate a leadership vote in which there was questions about the legitimacy of the votes. Because that goes. Well, I believe that, but what about my yeah. point? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I don't buy that. Like, I think. I really? Think that, yeah, I mean, she I would have blown up the electoral coalition to smithereens. Well, 
I mean, we don't we don't know what would have happened, right? Like, I think I think that there there's unknowns around what she would have done in a position of power. That I think we can't say that. But what we do know is that if you uh, if you win a leadership vote uh, in a fundamentally fraudulent process, there's no one doing that. And particularly when it comes to choosing a premier, there has to be a really high bar uh, of integrity around that. So I think the party really had no choice but to uphold that when it became clear that there was coordination happening with a third party. They just they really didn't have any choice. It's a goddamn funny thing when you run a leadership race and you say you're not allowed to bring in a coalition of your own making and sell memberships. I mean, maybe I don't like Pierre Polyev, but he sold 300,000 memberships by selling 300,000 memberships. And I know some people say, well, some folks were offered to pay their membership. And yeah, you got to crack down on that. But the fact that you say, well, one of our rules is you're not allowed to align with another group. Well, I don't understand that. Isn't that like, so you couldn't align with the labor group? You couldn't organize? Isn't that the, isn't I got to go find some infrastructure to raise memberships, make my pitch and support my candidacy? It's sort of like, sorry, we only want candidates who are not capable of selling memberships with any great particular number. It's a goddamn strange thing. It's like, hey, club is closed. Sorry, if you're not in the honeycomb hideout, you're not getting in. (laughs) Well, and the BC NDP is definitely the honeycomb hideout, you know? <laughs> yeah, I mean, listen, I I think that there's broader questions about how the BC NDP structures their leadership races, which you can be sure that the people who are on council there are looking at very closely right now. But at the end of the day, the rules being what they were at the time that the leadership race happened, the folks involved knew what the rules were and they did stuff that violated the rules. So there was really no choice, I think, uh, once it became clear the extent of the collaboration, it had to go down the way it did. And it's too bad. It is too bad. But that's that's where they landed. And I and I hope that, you know, for people who are enthusiastic uh, about the competitive candidacy, uh, that they take that lesson home. You know, if you're going to organize, that's fine and that's great, but do it fair and square. Corey, agree with me. This was one of those legal judgments that works from the outcome backwards, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. And we we had one in the federal conservative leadership race not too long ago, right? Where Patrick Brown was was tossed. So I, it's, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know. Like it, it's, um, I'm not close enough to, to know what the probability of uh, the other candidate winning was. But like if there was a good chance that they were going to win, uh, then that's obviously you know, a lot more controversial. I think when Patrick Brown got tossed, there was zero chance that he was going to win. And so therefore a lot less controversial, but you know, as you, as you go up the ladder of probability, it obviously becomes more controversial. Plus it was Patrick Brown. Right. Well, who was elected last night, by the way? Um, That's your, uh, that's your honor. They were your worship, your mayoralty, your eminency, your excellency. Your worship. Your Your excellency. (laughs) Your worship. It's your worship. (laughs) Yeah. Fucking weird. Weird. weird title weird title <laughs> um but yeah it's uh look it's uh it's controversial to have to toss somebody late in the process and you know the more transparency around that probably the better uh but uh, i do think there is a there is a larger truth to to what um scott's point is i think it depends who you're bringing in and how you know disruptive they are like you know, if if you're bringing in people that are very far afield from, you know, the electoral coalition that the party is was elected on, you're going to get a lot more resistance to that from people. Uh, and that's viewed as a outside takeover. And that's never going to go over well. If you're, uh, you know, doing that within the confines of, of you know, more established uh, coalition partners, uh, then it's then it's a lot less controversial. and There's a lot more latitude to do that. So, you know, if if. Uh, I don't know. I just think that's a reality of any organization. Excellent. These are all private clubs, right? Like they're not, this is not a public, you know, political parties are not public institutions. They're private clubs. People might Scott, not you like look to sad. Are that, you sad? That's true. What's you up? look sad. Are you sad? Desperately. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> Patrick found it. <laughs> well, I'm coming to that. I'm coming to that. But yeah, no, no, no. There's a whole range of factors, David. And when, uh, when um, well, you should invite me on the Hurley Burley so we can do a one-on-one interview. We just call it the sadness of Scott, and I think you know it'll <laughs> it'll attract many, many, many listeners. <laughs> All right, kids, it's time for Hey You, Gordon. Ladies and gentlemen, please return to your seats. The Hey Yous are about to begin. All right, who's up? Well, I'll go since it riffs off of this stuff. Uh, 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 
an easy segue. Um, last night in Brampton, Patrick Brown secured 60-ish plus percent of the votes and was re-elected as the mayor of Brampton. And uh, I'm going to use my AU to make a prediction. We get your eyes on us. Uh, no, we have our eyes on you, motherfucker. And I will predict right now that that guy does not finish out his term. Wherever he has been, scandal and controversy, skullduggery and sketch has followed him. It will follow him through this term and something will happen. It'll likely be rooted in contracts and weirdness. You watch. This guy won't finish out his term and it will end in flames. And then he will declare himself innocent and run for some goddamn other thing. I don't know, dog catcher Kalamazoo or something. And he'll win and declare himself vindicated. But you watch. He will not finish out his term. God, I hope we can someday stop talking about the guy on this pod. Jordan, you got to hate you. I do. Uh, and my hey is going out to all the municipal candidates except Patrick Brown, who ran in Ontario yesterday. <laughs> that is a hard job. It is a thankless job. We need good people to do it. So if uh, listeners, you know, if you were inspired by any of the campaigns you saw locally, please tell the candidate whether they won or they lost. If they've got some debt, make some phone calls, help them retire it. Uh, we need to make sure that good folks are ready to run uh, and then a, an extra special hey you out to Catherine McKenney for a very well thought campaign. Uh, they did a great job, even though it wasn't the result they wanted. Thanks. Right nice job. Corey? Uh, well, I'm going to toss one out to uh, a, a longtime uh, colleague and, and fellow backroom political uh, operator in the Conservative Party, Brian Patterson, who uh, this past weekend uh, rounded off out uh, his term as the uh, Conservative Party of Ontario uh, president uh, and did a phenomenal job for us uh, in, in that role. And it's it sort of a capstone to, to many different roles that he's had in politics over the years. Uh, executive director of the party, uh, uh, you know, longtime executive member, longtime political staffer and advisor to, to numerous ministers, uh, uh, most notably Tony Clement for a long time. But Brian, Brian is uh, is one of those people who knows everyone in our party and uh, uh, is a colorful character and a, and, a, and a source of a lot of wisdom and, and a mentor to a lot of folks. So I just wanted to say, hey, you, Brian, you did a, a great job. Uh, and Michael Diamond, who's coming in behind is us. He's also a colorful character. Too. He is, yes. Also yes. a colorful character, yeah. We like colorful characters in Ontario politics. <laughs> That's why I'm allowed to be here. So there you go. Michael Diamond sat beside me on a couch while I called Doug Ford a bit of a dick on CP24. And he That's was very right. colorful. He was very colorful <laughs> at that moment. Um, <laughs> a tough spot to be in. You don't want to be caught laughing, but you are on television. So it's kind of awkward for him. <laughs> my hey you, uh, my hey you goes out to Avi Lewis. Since I like the NDP to fail as a political organization. <laughs> I love Abby Lewis. I think that Abby Lewis is like a one-man wrecking crew for the New Democratic Party. He just goes from triumph to triumph. His fingerprints are all over this fucking mess in the leadership. And my God, you people, find a place to bury this guy before he buries you. <laughs> oh, that was good. Man, oh, man. Lordy, that was like my favorite meal served at a restaurant. That was sweet. I... I remember, I remember Avi. The first time I encountered him was in the '97 campaign when he was like working on Much Music, and uh, and Preston Manning came on to uh, to do uh, his pitch, uh, and and he took it upon himself to run his hand through Preston Manning's hair while on camera in the middle of like answering a question. It was among the more awkward, weird things I've ever seen in a political interview. And like the, you know, 25 plus years I've been doing this. Very strange, dude. Very what? fucking strange. Wait, wait, you can't leave it. What did Preston Manning do? Did he, how did he respond uh, to that? Did he permit uh, it to occur? He did he touch him, him back? back? Like, 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 so awkward. many questions. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe, maybe it was like a, some sort of a come on or something. I don't know. I would have gently 90s. touched his face. <laughs> and yeah. Yeah. All right. That's the curse <laughs> of politics for this misery, week. Please. I would like to thank all everybody who listened or watched. I'd like to thank our presenting sponsor. Tell us our sponsors, CN rail and diabetes Canada. And Obviously, I would like to thank Jordan, Scott, and Corey for their time today. Great show. A lot of fun. See you next week with more Curse of Politics. Take care.